I know. I know. I'm sorry. Oh. <laughs> I was going to say thank you, Kim. <laughs> Good morning. Good morning. Uh, kind of fitting that the way God puts things together, like the music this morning and the children's sermon this morning, and the focus quite a bit on prayer through all of that. Uh, <coughs> Let's start off with a word of prayer. Dear Lord, we, uh, we thank you for being with us this morning. For giving us an opportunity to come and praise and honor and glorify you. To possibly uh, receive a little more revelation of who you are. Lord, we're just humbled by your love for us. And dear Lord, don't ever let us take that for granted. We thank you this morning again for your presence, for your Son, and for the Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. Many of us are familiar with Philippians 4, 6, which says, The Lord is at hand. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything... By prayer and supplication, let your requests be known to God. We've already talked about that. And if we were to ask ourselves today, are we totally satisfied with our prayer life? How many of us would respond positively, yes, I pray as much and as well and as often as I should? I don't. If we're all honest for a moment, most of us would have to admit that probably we don't spend enough time in prayer. We don't pray enough, fervently enough, reverently enough. Many times we don't spend enough time in or enter into prayer in the right posture. For most people, prayer is often generated by anxiety. Health problems, financial troubles, loved ones in trouble, some sort of hardship. Sometimes people will even approach someone that they feel is more religious than they are to pray in their stead. For many, it is an uncertain attempt to communicate with an unknown God. It can lead to frustrating results, which in turn can lead to a further diminished prayer life or even giving up on prayer altogether. So at this point, you may think I'm leading into a how-to on prayer. And that's not the case. I think we need to look to Scripture, and particularly at Jesus, to discern the dilemma over an unsatisfactory prayer life. We'll start by looking into another familiar passage, Luke 11, 1 through 13. Most of us can recite the Lord's Prayer by heart. But the prayer in this passage differs a bit from Matthew 6. In Luke 11, now Jesus was praying in a certain place, and when he finished, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray. As John taught his disciples, and he said to them, when you pray, say, Father. Hmm. In Matthew 6, it says, pray then like this, our Father. But in Luke 11, it says, when you pray, say, Father. Leading up to this passage, we read that Jesus was praying in a certain place, and when he was finished, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray. In the time that the disciples had spent with Jesus, they had taken notice of his prayer life. They saw something different. He would often separate himself from everyone else. 
He would find a quiet place to be alone with God. God the Father. And he would pray at length, sometimes overnight. And when he was done, he was refreshed and restored and renewed. Seeing this, the disciples wanted to experience what Jesus was experiencing with his prayer life, leading to that request, Lord, teach us to pray. Notice they didn't say, teach us how to pray. I don't believe they were asking for a method. I rather believe they were asking, Lord, teach us. Give us the desire you have for prayer. To get to the place where we desire to and actually spend more time in prayer. Beyond talking about it, knowing about it, beating ourselves up for failure to do it. We need to have a greater desire. Greater than our obstacles that keep us from it. We need to have that desire for a regular fervor and reverent attitude of prayer to seek repentance and restoration, to seek renewal and to receive it. How do we go about creating this desire? Well, I believe Jesus gives that to them in verse two. When you pray, say, Father. This time more personal than in Matthew six, not our Father, this time just say, Father. More than anything else, knowing that God is your Father is the key to building a desire to pray. The more that we grasp that Father is just not a title of respect, but that He is really our Father, the more inclined we are to desire to communicate with Him, to spend time with Him, and to do that on a regular basis. When I was a child, the times that I got to spend alone with my father, usually fishing or hunting or something along those lines, but the times that my three brothers weren't there, it was just me and my father. Those were some really special times. <coughs> Jumping ahead in Luke 11 with, to 11.11, Jesus still speaking to the disciples, we read, What father among you, if his son asked for a fish, would instead give him a serpent? Or if he asked for an egg, would give him a scorpion? If you then who are evil, fallen fathers, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will the Heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to them who ask for? The first and last words Jesus speaks to them in response to their question, our Father and your Heavenly Father, and the answer to their need for this desire. Who God is to us will largely determine whether or how much time we, spend, we decide to spend with Him. We appreciate the love that God has for us enough. So as long as we're being honest, uh, the reality is that most of us seldom devote enough time to prayer. Is God kind of the, we know he's there, he's a title, he's our God, but he's uh, kind of removed. A higher power that we call on when we need him, or maybe he's a little bit of a tyrant to us because he wants everything we have. Hmm. And I just really don't want to give up all of it. Maybe we lack that relationship with Jesus. You know, the one where we place our faith in him and it opens our eyes to know God. To know him as our father. A father who loves us right here, right now. Which fosters his desire in our 
hearts to draw nearer to him through prayer. Jesus himself told us that I and the Father are one. We need to know Jesus to know the Father. Learn how to be a father by looking to God. We all know John 3.16 and what he's done for us. And if we want to know what a father looks like, God can help us. We can also look at what, what God the Father is by looking what it means for us to be a father. Look at our own experience. Even in this world of fallen fathers, think how much your children mean to you or mean to me. You'll start to get a handle on what we mean to God. Only three people in this world can call me dad. Two sons, one daughter. And if I picked up my phone, which you can do today out of your back pocket, right? And I had a whole list of messages being sent to me from people. And one of them was from one of my children. Which one do you think I would answer first? I believe it's no different with God. He answers his children. When your children were young, they might have first picked up a crayon and you gave them a piece of paper. And before long, they brought you a piece of paper with, filled with squiggly lines, and it was just an absolute mess. And here's a piece of advice. Don't try to guess what that is. Just ask them. Because I have never guessed right in my entire life, right? <laughs> and so you say, how beautiful, what is that? And they say, it's a dog. And you don't say, do you? Well, that's the worst excuse for a dog I've ever seen. No. You tell them what a beautiful dog that is. And you take that dog and you hang it on your refrigerator and you display it because they did that for you with love. And you love them too. When we start to what it looks for us, means for us to be a father or a mother, it helps us better understand the heart of God, the Father. In Luke 11, 11, or Luke 11, 11 through 13, Jesus is inviting us to reflect on our own experience of love in a human family to get a better handle on what we mean to our Father in heaven. A father finds joy in his children and children joy in their father. Luke eleven thirteen again, if you who are evil, and we know what evil means, we're fallen fathers, we're sinners, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will the Heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask Him? We cannot give what is beyond our capacity. God has no capacity. He has no limits. Just as we are always in our children's corner, even when, and especially when, things are at their worst, because they are our children, God is the same. And Jesus said, if we fallen fathers know what to give our children, how much more will the Father give us, especially concerning that supreme gift of the Holy Spirit, the very presence of God in our own lives. 1 John 3, 1 says, How great is the love of the Father has lavished on us that we should be called children of God. How much does a daughter or son mean to a parent? I have not lost one, but I believe you'd have to talk to someone who had to know the anguish and the indescribable pain that reflects the strength of the love that they have for that child. If the love of a fallen mother or father can be so strong, how much stronger is the love of a perfect father? Is 
Sorry, I'm not very organized. The degree to which we have a conscious awareness that God is your loving Heavenly Father is the degree to which you will have that desire to pray and communicate with Him. This is where the desire emanates from. If you know God loved you just a little, then you just pray a little. If you know God loves you a bit more, then you'll pray a bit more. But if you know how very much God the Father loves you, it should drive us to pray with him very much. The disciples asked Jesus, can you get our prayer life into gear? Jesus said, you need to know your father. To everyone who has placed their faith in Jesus Christ, you have a perfect father, one who delights in giving good gifts, one who knows what you need and when you need it, one who gives to you from his wisdom to accomplish his purposes in your life, one who loves us more than we could ever conceive, a father who will never die. Only God can say, I will never leave or forsake you. Your heavenly father delights when you draw near. Know him as your father, draw near and pray. So, maybe someone needs to know how does God become your father? If you're here today and don't have a father-daughter or father-son relationship with God, what do you do? Well, earlier we talked about my having three children. And at this point, there are also three spouses. And I'll use my eldest son as an example for you. He married a young lady from Omaha, Nebraska. I did not know her. The only things we had in common was uh, being human and U.S. citizens. <laughs> but through her love for my son and my son's love for her, they formed a union. A relationship which brought her into my family and made her a recipient of the love that I have for my son. She can call me father. We can enter the family of God through a union with his son. God's one and only son, Jesus Christ. Galatians 3.26, For in Christ Jesus you are all sons through faith. Some may wonder, why does it only say sons? Well, in ancient times, sons inherited, daughters did not. But Jesus fixed that, okay? In Scripture, this distinction is abolished. All inherit the work of Christ. Just as in the world today, all distinctions observed by people are abolished. They're abolished in Christ when we come to him in faith. John 1, 12, he says, But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. As we believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of God, who died in our stead, we will come to realize there was never a time when God did not love us. In Christ, he set his love on us before the creation of the world. He willed that we would be and that we would be redeemed. And as we believe in Jesus, we will come to see that there will never be a time when God will not love us. Jeremiah 31.3, God says, I have loved you with an everlasting love. In Psalm 68.5, an everlasting father, no beginning, no end everlasting poured out and made known to us in Jesus Christ 
who in love gave himself for us while we were still rebels, rebels or sinners. Jesus speaking in Matthew eleven twenty seven 27 says, all things have been handed over to me by my Father. And no one knows me except the Father. And no one knows the Father except the Son. And anyone to whom the Son chooses to reveal to him. Jesus is not standing around waiting to join our already crowded life. He is looking for people who realize their condition and with childlike humility are open to his revelation of their need for repentance and through faith their submission. The call to surrender to Jesus' lordship is essential to his invitation to salvation. Those unwilling to take his yoke cannot enter into a saving rest, a rest that he offers. We can't just be towing around a wagon full of sin and self and toss Jesus in there. I'm good to go, right? Jesus requires that we let go of our wagon and climb into his. That we give up these things that we deem so important and focus on him. Stan talked a little bit earlier about knowing God's will. You want to know God's will? Then know God. Develop that relationship with the Father and you will know his will. I could pretty much tell you what my father was going to do, say, or react in any given circumstance that we came up against. I could also tell you what he'd approve of me doing and not approve of me doing. It is no different with God the Father. If you know him, you will know what he wants and what he does not want. That is God's will. So as we approach our prayer life, we, we really need to focus on who God is. God is your Father if you've developed the relationship with His Son. Because no one knows the Father without the Son. And the fact that we can go to Him and say, Father, Dad, I got something I need to run by you. First of all, I want to tell you how wonderful you are. How awesome you are. How sovereign, how great you are. And then we need to talk about something. That's a pretty awesome fact right there that we can go do that. And the fact that we don't do it enough is not because he's not open to it. It has a little bit to do with our desire and what we do in place of that, right? I'm not here to chew anybody out. I'm totally in that boat, okay? <laughs> My prayer life could use some work. But here a while back in ABC, we did, uh, went through the Lord's Prayer. And we were using math here. When I turned to Luke and I read the word Father instead of our Father, I was like, wow. Yeah. yeah. My Father. Yeah. And I just felt like maybe. Uh, that was something we need to focus on a little more. So, Father, we thank you so much 
for being our Father. The God who created everything. Who brought in the Son and the Holy Spirit and, and knows all, sees all, no start, no end. Can we wrap our little minds around something like that? It makes it real tough, God, but the fact that we can know your Son and through your Son know you and through your word and the Holy Spirit, get little bits of revelation along the way that increase our knowledge of who you are. Lord, we just uh, thank you so much for being our Father. We do need to approach you more often. We do need to uh, consult you more in our plans. We make a lot of plans, Lord. And our plans always sound good until we get slapped in the face, you know. Maybe more often we ought to include you in our plans. Lord, I just can't thank you enough for the, the grace that you've shown me and, and all of your children. can't thank you enough for uh, this relationship. One day we will experience your saving grace. Your regeneration has taken place, but we will receive our forever, our forever heavenly bodies, Lord. And what a great day that will be. But until then, Lord, let me come to you, let me know you, let me seek you. Let me put you first in my life. Let me submit. And draw closer and closer to you. We pray that in Jesus' name, amen.